Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly look at news from around the world. This week, something slightly different. 20 years ago this week, the United States launched an invasion of Iraq. And frankly, for the last 20 years, we've been living with the consequences of that decision and in the way the war has been fought. We thought we'd take a look back on the implications of the war for the United States, for American foreign policy, for the Middle East, and for the world. And here to talk about those implications are three people who have looked at this question from the very beginning and continue to look at it uh, as, we, as we speak. Susan Glasser. Staff writer for The New Yorker. Susan, great to have you back. Thank you so much for having me, Eva. Carla Ann Robbins, now a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, but reported for The Wall Street Journal and The New York Times on the Iraq War. Carla, great to see you. Nice to see you, Evo. And Gideon Rockman, chief foreign affairs commentator for The Financial Times, another person who has been looking at the Iraq War and so much else as well. Susan, let's start with you uh, and look at the implication of this really momentous decision. And in Richard Haas's term, a war of choice rather than a war of necessity. Uh, and what the impact has been on the United States, on the U.S. society, on U.S. politics, uh, and the United States uh, as, as a country. Well, Evo, thank you so much for doing this. I think it's really important. And I'm struck in some ways by how, uh, you know, there hasn't been as much of a discussion around the war 20 years later as I thought there might have been. Obviously, it's a very busy time, uh, both here in Washington and around the world. So that may be part of it. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back, of course, uh, to start this conversation to where I was 20 years ago this week, which was uh, as, a, as a journalist for The Washington Post in Kuwait, waiting for the invasion to begin. And, you know, I shared this story in my New Yorker column because it made such an indelible impression on me. But my job was going to be to travel as a unilateral reporter that is uh, not embedded with the U.S. troops to see the reaction on the ground uh, of Iraqis. And um, I was traveling, I was going to travel with a very seasoned foreign correspondent, uh, my friend named Ed Gargan. And he was a link to an earlier era of American politics in the Vietnam War. He had actually protested the Vietnam War, uh, uh, been, a, been a draft resistor in that conflict. And so he had a different frame of reference. And I will never forget uh, when the, the war began. And we were at the headquarters hotel of the press in, in this war at the Hilton uh, in Kuwait very luxury hotel, very surreal environment, actually, uh, to be awaiting the start of a war. And uh, when the operations began, they ordered uh, the soldiers there to don their full combat gear in this luxury hotel, including carrying their weapons. So we're sitting there at breakfast on the sand, looking out of the Persian Gulf uh, in this sort of surreal, beautiful scene, drinking the fresh squeezed orange juice. And these soldiers show up, uh, you know, young soldiers in full camouflage and guns. And Ed, my seasoned correspondent friend, uh, looks at them and he just jumps up without warning. And he starts doing this like a, like a, like a cheerleader thing. He says, give me a Q, give me a U, give me a G. And he spells out quagmire. Uh, and of course, he's getting increasingly hostile glares from from the soldier sitting next to us. And, you know, I'm like grabbing him like, Ed, sit down. You're going to get a shot or something. But, you know, I didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect, but I certainly didn't expect a quagmire. Uh, and I think it was very telling and prescient that uh, someone who had the frame of reference about Vietnam, both in terms of its consequences for the world, but specifically the consequences it would have for the United States itself in launching such a war of choice. Uh, that was something that uh, was right there for us to see on the first day of the war, but not everybody, in fact, almost everybody did not see it. Uh, and uh, so I would like to begin with that in this conversation today, because I, I do think that the long shadow of Vietnam uh, and of Iraq hangs over us in, in American politics today, certainly. Uh, you have arguably a situation where uh, multiple presidents, 
would not have been elected were it not for George W. Bush's really catastrophic decision to to invade Iraq. And Barack Obama, as we all recall, uh, first came to national prominence as uh, an objector to the idea of this conflict. He was just an unknown state legislator in Illinois at the time, gave a very memorable speech uh, opposing the war. Uh, of course, Donald Trump, he initially did, by the way, support the war before he was against it, but uh, was vehement in his political incarnation as an opponent, not only of the Iraq war, but of George W. Bush, uh, uh, calling him a failed president, normalizing, I think, the idea among Republicans, uh, as well as Democrats, that it was okay to say that this war had been a costly and catastrophic mistake. Uh, arguably, it, it is the backlash uh, within the Republican Party that has driven this populism movement uh, and that has had uh, a, a profound effect in turning many, if not all Republicans, I think it's not all Republicans, but many Republicans against the kind of brash militarism uh, expressed by George W. Bush and against, broadly speaking, the, the internationalist uh, consensus uh, among Republicans that drove their views of foreign policy ever since the days of Ronald Reagan. And so I think that uh, in terms of the domestic political consequences, you could argue that there really is is uh, uh, an Iraq syndrome in our politics today. It's it's arguably what's driving some of the Republican critiques in the emerging 2024 presidential race about the U.S. involvement in the uh, war on uh, in Ukraine and the U.S. support for Ukraine. You hear this sort of uh, isolationist America first strand of arguments taking shape, this breathtaking comments by Ron DeSantis that it was just a territorial dispute, uh, really a kind of screw up that, that caused him immediately to have to walk it back. But again, in the big picture sense, I just think we're, we're living with the politics of this, although I take the point, and I think it's an important point, that unlike Vietnam, the societal uh, conversation around Iraq has largely largely subsided and and ebbed uh, almost certainly because the terrible human costs of it uh, on the U.S. side were borne uh, by a volunteer army uh, and that uh, it, it didn't have the presence in you know all sectors of the United States in the way uh, that Vietnam, which was fought with young draftees. Did. So I'll stop there. But again, I, I just appreciate the chance to kind of air out this this conversation. No, Susan, that's a, that, that's great. I'd, I'd add on the societal piece, of course, also a war without any taxes. So that uh, there was uh, was it was paid for by you as debt uh, and also felt less in that way. Gideon, of course, you you looked at this uh, not through a U.S. lens, but through a British lens, the, the, the other country uh, that let's not forget joined the war. Uh, uh, led by Tony Blair, who 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 aligned himself uh, very strongly with George W. Bush in making the decision to go to war, uh, and, and that too uh, had uh, real consequences for uh, for him, uh, for the party uh, that he led, but also for politics in, in in Britain. Sure, actually, there were several other countries. I mean, Blair was clearly the most prominent foreign person making the case for war and sort of uh, the alliance with the United States. But, you know, I was working actually in Brussels at the time and it split the EU right down the middle. You know, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese were also with America. And one shouldn't forget that. Um, and I think in terms of Britain, you know, it's it's similar about this question. Well, how big was the impact? Because in some ways it sort of destroyed Tony Blair as a politician. But that's actually an oversimplification. He actually won the 2005 election pretty handily, you know, and by that point it was clear Iraq had gone badly wrong. But somehow his reputation never really recovered from the war despite that. And it's interesting, you know, Blair's become... Uh, you know, uh, he's built a very successful international consulting business. But if you go to Tony Blair Associates in London, there's nothing on the door to say Tony Blair, because I think it's too dangerous to put his name on there. He's, you know, so toxic for for many people uh, in, in Britain, uh, not everybody. But um, but so there was this feeling that 
yeah, the war went badly wrong. And then the question is, it's a bit similar to America. How much effect has it had on us? I think the effect is sort of quite insidious. Um, you know, I think we also had, like the United States, a populist anti-elitist movement. A lot of things fed into that. But I think the Iraq war was one of them. Uh, this sense that uh, the elite had either lied or proved themselves to be massively incompetent. That, uh, you know, as Susan was saying, it was a volunteer army. Me, but uh, you know, there were a lot of people died, and, and in a sense, the fact that it wasn't the elites' kids who were going to fight this war adds to the sense of dislocation. Um, and so, I don't think you can draw a direct line from the Iraq War to the Brexit vote, and then the subsequent sort of turmoil in British politics. But I think there's a sort of, if you like, a dotted line. They're, they're certainly connected. But I think in terms of foreign policy, again, there is a kind of analogy to the United States, which is that. There was a period where we thought, OK, we're going to have to really adjust, learn these lessons. And what would those lessons be in Britain? Don't get involved in foreign wars, you know, foreign interventions, and maybe be a bit shyer of getting following whatever the current uh, thinking is in Washington. And that kicked in for a while. So you saw when Obama tried to intervene in Libya, albeit uh, half-heartedly, uh, Syria, um, the Brits, British Parliament voted against. And I think that wouldn't have happened without Iraq. But now, actually, a bit like America, perhaps, we're defaulting to, to the way it was before, which is um, looking to a sort of global role, being very closely associated with the United States, uh, at least willing to threaten, you know, quite, quite um, upfront in our support for Ukraine, arguably even more kind of uh, gung-ho on that than, than America, and also backing the US increasingly vocally in its confrontation with China. So. Uh, I think it, it sort of had a, more of a social effect, really, than a foreign policy effect. Uh, Carla, how do you how do you see the? Uh, I mean, I think uh, Gideon, uh, By the way, thanks. I think that was uh, uh, makes a, makes a lot of sense. And this this incredible vote in uh, what was it, two thousand thirteen, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, uh, Obama wanted to uh, the red line on chemical warfare had been crossed and and was ready to at least appear to be ready to launch military action, but then the British. <laughs> The British vote came, uh, and uh, there were doubts within the White House about this as well. Again, I think because of Iraq, uh, uh, sort of played out in there. But uh, Carla, um, uh, how do you see it? What is the impact on on sort of the, the politics and uh, here at home? Uh, before we get to the issue of foreign policy and the credibility of the United States, well, we'll come next. But sort of, how do you see this? So you know, in the United States, continuing what Susan was saying, and a lot like what Gideon was talking about in Britain, you know, Iraq has become synonymous with the government and the intelligence community lies to you. And, you know, I, I see bashing as a bipartisan Washington sport. But, you know, I think among the elite in Washington, it's really situational and quite self-serving. You know, the Democrats who diss the IC over Iraq <laughs> have very eagerly embraced the findings on Russian inf interference in the 2016 election. Yeah. And the Republicans who followed Trump and, you know, using the Iraq failure as their foil to undermine the claims on Russian interference and are conducting this incredible select investigation about the deep state. Um, they're also, you know, just in the last week, week or two, eagerly embraced this energy department, very low level of confidence finding on that it all came from the lab in Wuhan. So, you know, I, Washington, as Susan wrote, has absolutely no memory. And most, significant, most significantly, Washington, there's been no effort at accountability for Iraq. And that's, I think, one of the differences with Vietnam. There's been no commission investigating, not just the intelligence failure and the travel to war. There's been no commission looking about what came afterwards, you know, and all the mis mismanagement. There hasn't been a fog of war movie. I mean, there's just been absolutely no, there's been no serious discussion about Abu Ghraib. Even, you know, I barely even in the look back, uh, all the coverage, people aren't talking about Abu Ghraib. They talk about WMDs a lot more than Abu Ghraib. And to be perfectly frank, I'm more upset about Abu Ghraib than I am about WMDs. And so, and I think when you look about the, and we can talk about the international, I think Abu Ghraib has had equal effect to that. So... That may in part, you know, explain why the rest of the country feels this incredible sense of the loss of credibility for Iraq, because there is no accountability in Washington. So when I talk to my students and I mentioned Colin Powell, you know, and I, who I still revere in many ways, um, and my students who many of whom were in, in elementary school in 2003, they immediately launch into how he personally lied to us. 
and what an incredible failure he was. And if you look at the polling data, you know, Gallup looks at this trust in institutions year after year. You know, a poll taken in 2001, just days before 9-11, found that 63% of Americans said they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the executive branch. By 2006, that trust number was down 17 points to 46%. And last year, the trust number was 43%. Now, it's not all a wreck. I mean, you know, you see this, this thing going down because all, trust in all institutions have been going down and, and far, you know, before Iraq as well. But Iraq, I think, played a big, big role in that loss of credibility. And, you know, and I really do blame it on the, you know, Iraq, obviously a huge failure of government. Government did lie to us. But I also think that the failure to have accountability has is, is really had a big impact as well. Very important point uh, on the lack of accountability certainly is is, is the case. And there's a, a recent memo, I think, that was unearthed uh, that uh, Melvin Lever, uh, Leffler talks about in his new book, uh, in, in a piece in Foreign Affairs yesterday, that came out of an accountability discussion. It was uh, the 9-11 Commission that interviewed Bush and found out what sort of the mood was uh, before the, the decision to go into Iraq. And so you had accountability for 9-11 to some extent, and certainly a lot of lessons learned, but none for uh, none, none for the U Iraq war. And we have actually got a, a piece on, on public opinion, which uh, uh, just re reaffirms everything, uh, Carla, you said, which is that the silent and boomer uh, uh, generations trust an institution is much higher than Gen Z and Gen X. And this is a lasting impact, not just of Iraq, but everything else uh, that, uh, that that came in there. Can I just actually, say one other thing? Sorry. Just quickly, uh, there is a slight contrast with the UK there, which we, we did have a long, long official inquiry called the Chilcot Inquiry, which right. produced a 12 volume report into it, which I think did contribute actually to the difficulty of Tony Blair ever like coming back afterwards. And in fact, currently there's a, a judge led inquiry into war crimes by British troops uh, in Afghanistan and whether, whether there was a shoot to kill policy. So there's some of that going on, but it's you know, I wouldn't say the Chilcot Inquiry, perhaps because it was so long. I mean, you know, so lengthy that not, not many people read it, you know. Um, but yeah, I think this is made. an extremely important point about accountability and lack thereof and why it has had a corrosive effect on our institutions. I'm so glad that Carla brought up the, you know, Abu Ghraib and, you know, sort of the, the hollowness of, uh, you know, America's stated rationale, not just on WMD, but even if it was there as a democratizing force, uh, what's the signal thing that if you told yourself in 2003, right? Think about it this way. If you told yourself in 2003, well, not only would the U.S. invade Iraq and, you know, not find the WMD and, uh, you know, not create this sort of beacon of democracy, you probably wouldn't have been that shocked, honestly, by that. You would have been dismayed, but not that shocked. What really would have shocked you is that 20 years later, the state of our own democracy and the crisis within that this was a contributing factor for. That's the part that I think none of us really understood is the idea that it was in, in a, a, the failure of our institutions led to a crisis in our institutions and contributed to a crisis in our political system that is very much ongoing. And it's in that context that I think it's very important to assess, I don't think we know the answer, but to assess the culpability and the extent to which uh, the political class that made this decision has ever faced any blowback for it. And I found it really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I reported that President Bush was here in Washington just a few weeks ago uh, for a book party with his um, former national security team. They just released a book of their transition memos to the Obama uh, people, uh, an example, by the way, of a good of a good transition. Uh, and we haven't had any uh, in this Trump era. So that's something. Uh, but uh, you know, Bush privately, he won't talk about it at all publicly, which arguably is a mistake. But privately, uh, he's so unrepentant that the person who told me about this was a senior official in the Bush administration who was, quote, shocked uh, and amazed by how un reflective and unrepentant the former president is. Uh, and, you know, what you hear from them, and it's in that Mel Leffler book to a certain extent, is this sort of two things. One, the exculpatory idea as far as they're concerned that 
All of Washington was in a panic after 9-11. You have to understand their state of mind. You have to understand every day President Bush is, you know, hearing this threat matrix of all these terrible things that could happen. Uh, Saddam had previous use of WMD chemical weapons against his own people. Uh, and, you know, therefore, and of course had lied also about his arsenal. So why wouldn't he do this again? Uh, you know, this is the the arguments they're using. That's one. I've heard. And then the other argument 20 years later of the revisionists, uh, you know, in the Republican camp is, well, you know, it actually was a good thing that we got rid of Saddam. And, uh, you know, can you imagine, uh, you know, what what the situation would be like today? And, um, you know, again, I, I just I find that to be both not compelling, but it it, it fails to account for uh any sense of culpability. I think it's like a lot of our political debates. It's probably over the wrong things. You know, I, I, I agree with Carla that the WMD evidence suggests that at least when it comes to George W. Bush personally, perhaps not all of those around him who were cheering this on, I don't think there's evidence to suggest that he knowingly uh, lied about it, that he, he sought to misrepresent the intelligence. I think he made... Uh, a decision more or less in good faith uh, based on what he thought he knew. Now, did his political apparatus make a good faith argument then to sell the war? That, I think, no. And this is an argument I often have, uh, even here at home. I, I, I just, I think that they sold the American public publicly uh, a bill of goods about 9-11 and the nexus between Saddam Hussein's government and the 9-11 hijackers, a, a nexus that was not there. Uh, and, you know, I think it, Condi Rice talking about mushroom clouds on Meet the Press was extremely disingenuous. I, I'll just leave it at something I've never forgotten from uh, going out and talking to some of the American uh, military who were in the Kuwait desert in the run up to the war. And I was out there one day uh, talking to these very young soldiers, because that's the thing, soldiers who are sent to fight wars are really young. And that's what you notice. Uh, and these boys were teenagers were preparing to attack and they were writing on the side of the missiles that they were going to use in combat remember 9-11 remember the twin towers and i i said to them hey guys you know that saddam hussein didn't do 9-11 right you know that and they didn't know that and they didn't know that and regardless of the the hair splitting by george w bush uh you know he sent those boys off to war with them thinking that they were avenging 9-11 Strong words and uh, uh, lot, uh, a, a lot of truth and a lot of think about there. Um, uh, Carla, uh, let's, let's sort of broaden the, the, the perspective because um, the implications of all of this is not only on what happens in American society, but in America's ability to get stuff done around the world. And the rest of the world is looking at the United States uh, and and wondering, okay, can we really trust them? What is the credibility of the United States that that is out there? I remember one of my first meetings at NATO. I sat down with a German ambassador, and he said, who had been the deputy uh, during the Iraq War, and he said the worst time he had ever had in government was when the alliance was split over Iraq. He said, I will never, I can, I will never be able to work in an environment where that happens again. So being together with the US or being together is absolutely critical. Um, that was the lesson that they had learned. Um, but the other lesson was, well, which US is showing up? Uh, and uh, of course, that is a question that uh, many are asking. So uh, the credibility, the impact on the United States, its ability to get stuff done and to be seen to be doing it for the right reasons as opposed to for, its, uh, for, for the wrong reasons. What is the impact of the war on that? So I think you and I think Gideon's made this point. I think you've got to separate which part of the world you're talking about. Um, the trauma in Europe, you know, and the splits, you know, old Europe, new Europe, the way Cheney was characterizing it. You know, I think in Europe, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has wiped out probably the last of those bad memories. Um, and it's also pretty much wiped out the more recent bad memories, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, 
although the people I talk to, and I'm sure the people everybody else here talks to, it hasn't wiped out their, you know, their terror of the return of Trumpian nativism. Um, they're still afraid of that. And that's the which America is going to show up too. But I think Ukraine has really wiped out a lot of that for Europe. Uh, the story is really different in what we call the global South. You know, that perception that we believe the rules apply to everyone but us is still really raw 20 years later. And I think we're only really beginning to recognize the effect of that when we see allies or supposed allies like India sitting on the fence in Ukraine, or how many countries are just shrugging off what the ICC has done with Putin. You know, it's for, for you know, the, for the global South, it's like for a lot of Americans, Iraq is synonymous with the American, that, you know, the U.S. doesn't care, the U.S. lies. And how dare you lecture us on Ukraine? And that's if you look at the UN vote on even the most recent UN vote on 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 Ukraine. You know, I'm not surprised that Belarus, you know, <laughs> voted against that. I'm not surprised that Nicaragua voted against it. But they had more than 30 countries, many of which are countries that we consider, you know, beneficiaries of American foreign aid. The sort of people who have you know, gone to school in the United States, people who we thought were really good candidates for alliances. And they're just sitting there saying, you are not the boss of us because and in many ways, that's because of Iraq and all that Iraq means. Um, and, and you know, the rules don't apply to us. Rules don't apply to us, Gideon. Uh, is that sort of uh, uh, the way in which the world is, is, is now moving that uh, the U.S. lost a, a lot of credibility in, in, in the kinds of places that it, that it mattered, uh, including, including in Europe, where there are, you know, still, I think, debates about the U.S. Can I say one thing? I don't agree with the argument, okay? I don't think, the no, argument, I, I think it's what aboutism, okay? I don't agree with the argument. I'm just saying the argument exists. Yeah. Get in, you're, you're still muted. Sorry, there, there was a hailstorm going on in London, so I thought I'd spare you that. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think I think it does linger, of course, and I think it had two effects on uh, what you might call American credibility. One is the rules don't apply to us, and of course, you know, you every time you say, "But look how many thousands of people Russia's killed in Ukraine, civilians included." People say, "Well, you know, how many civilians did you, did America kill in Iraq?" And it's it's a uh, uh, there are answers to that, you know, the parallels aren't precise, whatever, but it's it's not an obvious answer where you can immediately say, well, that's absurd. And, you know, what about is, I, I agree, it's, it's a bit of a kind of annoying form of argument, but it is how people argue. That's, that's how we make moral judgments. You know, we say, well, if you tolerate this, why would you not tolerate that? That's, that's, uh, so it's, it's kind of inevitable. But the other impact I think it's had on American credibility is just on, do we trust these guys' judgment? You know, don't they? So, so if you're sitting in an, in the UK, where we we made this ultimately the same decision as America, we have the same uh, kind of moral culpability. So, but one of the arguments here is, as you see America heating up towards, say, Taiwan uh, or over China in general, you know, is this another example of America going over the top, or or should we back them? You you get uh, both views, but but it's 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 created a big question mark about well, you know, when, when Washington tells us this is incredibly important, do we still believe them? So I, I think that's a, a a really good point in the Taiwan issue is, and by the way, that was a lingering problem in the Ukraine issue to the extent that the U.S. was sending the information and the intelligence out there. People were doubting it in part because of uh, the, Iraq, the, the Iraq precedent. But the point I think uh, uh, both you and Carla make, uh, 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 Gideon, uh, for Susan is is, is hubris. Uh, and, and the degree of hubris, both in the idea that we are good and therefore, by definition, our actions can't be bad, but also we are capable. And I think if there is one thing that really uh, seems to have emerged out of this, it turns out we're not very capable. In fact, in the last 20 years, we've engaged in two wars, one of which we lost outright. And because Afghanistan is a loss, when you remove a government, uh, run a country for 20 years and then have the government come back. That's called losing a war. Uh, and, and it's hard to think that the United States won in Iraq. It's clearly the Iranians did. Um, but the incompetence that was part and parcel of that, uh, also has a capacity on the, on, on the capabilities. And, you know, some of the more insightful, 
folks who were in favor of the war have now recognized that perhaps the U.S. is not particularly good at exporting democracy at the uh, point of a bayonet. But what's the impact, Susan, of of, of that part of the, the hubris uh, that was uh, there in 2003, and you, you you also see in the early uh, in the earliest discussions within the administration, we can it'll be a cakewalk, and there'll be there'll be flowers uh, in the streets, etc. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that is an important uh, uh, aspect of this story, and yet it's often subordinated to the kind of they lied to us conversation, and it might be uh, in some ways the more uh, geopolitically relevant part of the conversation is uh, about the ability to have a foreign policy that we can execute on in in, in a meaningful strategic way. Uh, and. If you would ask me actually back in 2003, 2004, what was your experience on the ground of covering the war? It's not the lying as much as the incompetence that I would have focused on at the time. That was the lived experience of it, was the absolute almost catastrophic failure of uh, uh, the planning, the way we thought about it, and what the, the, the actual impacts of it were. So here's a couple of uh, examples. Uh, you know, one, the cakewalks the you know we the americans would be greeted uh you know by cheers uh because saddam had oppressed the shia of southern iraq for example that's where i was uh, uh spent the time covering on the ground in southern iraq it is true uh that horrific repression took place there uh and in fact uh you know that remains a searing takeaway for me americans uh because they're so polarized politically and so divorced from the realities of other co countries have often tended to overlook that they shouldn't overlook that saddam hussein was a terrible tyrant and dictator uh you know i literally uh stood there with men who had been tortured in the cells that they had just been released from showing me all the horrific things i spoke with doctors who had been forced to cut off the ears of deserters uh, uh, because that's how it worked uh, in, in, in Saddam Hussein's regime. And so that's really important. And yet these people were not literally on day one of the war. They were stoning uh, the American vehicles as they streamed across the border from Kuwait into Iraq on day one. Uh, they were placing landmines, uh, you know, on the road. They were resisting. Uh, and to the extent they weren't resisting, uh, they were welcoming an American uh, regime that was going to now come into place that didn't exist, that did not exist. There was the failures of planning were extraordinary. Uh, there, we were all waiting, you know, the journalists as well as the Iraqi people for a kind of competent, uh, invasion force that, that would come in and immediately restore order. That didn't happen. Uh, number one. Number two, there was, I think at the heart of it, a, a deep rooted cynicism, uh, in particular on the part of those who really advocated for the war, people like Donald Rumsfeld, uh, and Dick Cheney, they, they, they had the kind of arrogance and superpower hubris that we're now seeing from Vladimir Putin. Remember, Putin's initial strategy in the Ukraine invasion, it was not that dissimilar to the shock and awe uh, of the American strategy in Iraq. Putin seems to have planned a decapitation strike on Ukraine's government. The idea that they would swoop in, use special forces, get rid of the government, essentially lop off the top of the Ukrainian regime, and then, uh, you know, install a more favorable government to Russia and then have a big parade. They told the officers, bring your parade uniforms and your medals uh, and then get back out. Uh, that to me is very similar to the kind of assumptions, failed assumptions that undergirded uh, the American uh, plan in Iraq. And I think, so that's number one is, uh, you know, that competence uh, matters, correct analysis matters, execution of that, the incredible ignorance uh, of the United States should not be understated as a factor in world affairs. I mean, that that's what I and the other journalists saw firsthand on the ground. And by the way, in Afghanistan, as well as in Iraq, uh, you know, failed policies result from failed premises uh, and from a failed understanding or an imperfect understanding of other places. Uh, and just to be a little bit more geopolitical, because this is a, you know, a big picture international conversation, the assumptions about the Middle East 
uh, and what the result of getting rid of Saddam Hussein would be, were also completely, I, I think, very tragically failed. Uh, you know, rather than uh, undercutting uh, the Iranian regime that's been enemy number one for the United States ever since uh, 1979, um, it arguably empowered Iran in in the Middle East for uh, many, many subsequent years. And certainly it empowered Iran in uh, its neighbor, Iraq, against whom had it fought an extremely uh, deadly and bloody war uh, in the previous decade, in the 1980s. Well, essentially, we picked one side in that war, uh, and the side was not Iraq. We, we essentially empowered Iran uh, to impose its own will on a weakened and unstable neighbor for two decades to come. So uh, that's literally the exact opposite of what American policymakers would have said was the goal uh, of the war. Uh, the, the, certainly the credibility gets affected in, in, in that way. And, and sort of, I, I want to get to uh, uh, one other sort of even bigger picture, Gideon, and, and that sort of uh, how has, and, and Susan already mentioned it with regard to Russia, but how has the behavior of other powers really been affected by by this war? And I'm really thinking of, uh, of China, uh, mm -hmm. an observer of the failed war in Iraq, frankly, in Afghanistan, um, looking at the United States uh, in, in, in through, through different sets of glasses over time. Uh, what do you think the analysis is in in uh, in Beijing looking back at this war and how it affects their perception of what it is that they might be able to do with regard to the to the United States? Well, my my sense is that um, you know in a way the Chinese have thought less deeply about Iraq uh, than say maybe Russia, but I think it does, that there are some commonalities in the Russian Chinese view. One is that the U.S. is a hypocrite, as they will they will they will always argue, and Iraq is part of that. The second is that the U.S. is feckless, and that but also that the U.S. is dangerous. You know, so um, you know the Americans may uh, lose interest uh, eventually, and I think that's sort of what Putin is counting on in Ukraine. Uh, but they have um, awesome power, not. You know, you talked about this capability. They they have the capability to overthrow a government. They don't have the capability to reconstruct it. And actually, listening to what Susan was saying about, you know, how Putin, in a sense, modeled what he was doing in Ukraine and what America did in Iraq. Well, look how much worse it's gone for him. You know, he didn't get to Baghdad, Kiev, and he also found a sort of enormous international alliance willing to back the the opponents in, in the way that people wouldn't, which is a commentary on how scared or not scared people are of Russia. You know, so Russia's attempt to be America in this role, even on their own borders, has not worked out very well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, nobody's writing off American power because of Iraq, but I think that they, they have question marks about how it's used, but you know, and and how quixotic or American judgment basically is. I, I think the, the question, but on uh, the global South thing is quite interesting because obviously that's become a big preoccupation for America for everybody. Why uh, are these countries not rallying behind the U.S. Uh, and and Europe on uh, Russia? And I think partly it's it, it is. Iraq, these moral questions. But it's interesting talking to, you know, I've been to South Africa, India, Indonesia quite recently, and a lot of the history they cite actually is their own history, and it goes even further back. You know, so the South Africans will talk about, well, who backed us in the struggle against apartheid? The Indonesians will go back to America's role in the 1960s, uh, you know, and, and what, what they did or didn't do in the overthrow of Sukarno. Um, so everybody's got their own history. I mean, the Indians sometimes go on about about, uh, America's role in the Bangladeshi War of Independence in 1971. I mean, who who in America even remembers that? But these things uh, are very deep in, in those countries. So I suppose what I'm saying is that you can't really assume that absent Iraq, it would all be okay. Um, people have complex views about America. And I think in the end, where they come down on something like Ukraine, it comes back to their own interests. You know, the Europeans have rallied because they see Russia as a threat to them, and the, the, the rest of the global south doesn't really. And, and I think that's as fundamental as Iraq.
Yeah, no, I think uh, national interest and national perspectives clearly uh, uh, are usually a good way to start any uh, form of analysis. So I think that's apt and 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 interesting that you know the Indonesians and and, and the Indians and South Africans take a pre-rock perspective, although not in in, in many ways surprising. Carla, uh, it, j jump in here on 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 sort of this this bigger uh, uh, macro question, and 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 also I think you know it would particularly get your sense of. Of this this overestimation of what the United States could do, I remember um, uh, George Bush in his victory speech on that aircraft carrier uh, saying that we now have the power to remove governments without major war. We have the technology. Uh, never thinking about well, when you remove a government, you need to put something else in, in there in order to. Uh, uh, in order to govern the country, uh, you know, just as they did in Afghanistan when he asked Condi Rice uh, 10 days after the war, uh, who's going to govern after the Taliban is gone? And Rice saying, oh, my God, I hate it when the president asks you questions uh, that you hadn't thought about, which is kind of interesting, that you would go to war and overthrow a country, uh, and a government without thinking about who would come in and govern next. But that's where we were, right? Well, several things here, in which in play for what Susan and, and Gideon were saying as well. First of all, we do have the power to remove governments. Um, we have awesome military power. And that's one of the lessons that the Chinese and the Russians took away from this. Uh, you know, they spent a lot of money, uh, just not particularly effectively, as we now see in the case of the Russians. And the Chinese, you know, can we point to the Chinese military buildup um, solely because of Iraq? Uh, no, but certainly I, you know, I think it, I think you can credit some of it. And part of it is because I think you can go back to the Gulf War also. I mean, you can look at, at you can look at that extraordinary ability that we have to, you know, to play basically video games and, and, and kill, you know, kill other people and not kill, killed ourselves. And I think lots of governments and particularly governments that are afraid of potentially going into a war with us, they started thinking, what can we buy that is that sophisticated that can do it, you know, that can do it that way without fingerprints. And that's a pretty extraordinary thing. Um, you know, when you were talking about this as, as well, <laughs> let's talk about Libya for a minute. It's it's not just the Bush and not just the Bush administration that doesn't do follow through. Obama didn't want to do Syria. He didn't want to do Libya before that. He he got to a great extent drawn into or dragged into Libya against his will for people who I think felt guilty about Rwanda, uh, rightly felt guilty about Rwanda, but. You know, the way I remember it from my reporting is that people from the Pentagon went into the Oval Office and said, and what's the plan for the day after? And Obama said, not my problem. The Europeans are going to do it. So the lesson that you don't you know, fight a war unless you've got a plan for the day after is not one that Obama had figured out either. Um, and so I think that when we talk about a lack of accounting and, you know, and not thinking these things through, I'm not sure how much we have learned from that. That's a depressing uh, way to to uh, end this. So uh, let's not end. We have a couple more minutes. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 it might be depressing, but appropriate, Eva. Uh, no, <laughs> so let's, uh, in that case, let's just end it there. No, uh, no, no, no. But I feel much more, I feel much more positive about Ukraine. I would like to think that we're planning a major rebuilding and all, all of that. I think, you know, I, I do feel that, that we're doing the right thing in Ukraine. And I, I don't see this as hubris. So I, I, I don't think think that right. Iraq, there's a direct line from failures in Iraq and what we're doing in Ukraine. So I I, uh, the, 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 I think that's right, although it's different to have to rebuild a country that has been invaded and, and destroyed than a country you invaded and destroyed, okay. uh, uh, as we see in Afghanistan, Iraq versus versus Ukraine. I, I, I do wonder, though, just in the in the minute that we have left and get your, your view, the extent to which we have learned uh, the, the, the lesson that, in fact, we can't invade and we can't promote democracy at the uh uh at the point uh, of our bayonet that in fact the this idea that you can go in uh overthrow a country uh, and then it will emerge as a stronger uh, more democratic country my sense that no one believes that anymore and clearly libya was one reason why people don't believe that anymore so it is it is a multitude of lessons and that does suggest that there might be limits to the degree of intervention and military uh, uh interventionism we've had 
uh, in the future uh, compared to where the past. And maybe that's the good big lesson that comes out of Iraq. Susan? Well, I mean, Evo, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that for now, and I would just say for now, asterisk underscore for now, that is more or less the consensus across political lines. And yet, right, it's it's the future presents not the exact same case study as the past. And, you know, there are some, plenty of people who would argue that the mood right now in Washington, again, across party lines, that a very rapid conventional wisdom has formed around, uh, you know, the need for confrontation and the inevitability of confrontation with China, even potentially of a military nature. Uh, it reminds some people, and I understand why, uh, about the political climate in the run-up to the Iraq war. These are very different stories. They have very different uh, politics to them. They have very different potential consequences. It's one thing to go to war to overthrow an unsavory government in uh, Panama or in uh, even in Iraq for that matter, than it is to have uh, this kind of a dangerous potential military confrontation with one of the world's other leading superpowers. And so, you know, I don't think we're going to face the exact same kind of crisis in the past, uh, but I would say it would be just as much hubris for us to think that a lesson has been definitively learned and moved on from, because that is not the story of American foreign policy, uh, and it, you know, it runs in cycles. And I undoubtedly, there will be a moment in time when we will confront this set of questions again, and where our policymakers will will lean on the same set of decisions. When we grew up, we thought that Vietnam meant that it could be never again. Uh, you know, that the United States would never embark on a conflict like that. Iraq wasn't the same as Vietnam, uh, but it did present a similar set of challenges. And you know, I do have no doubt. That that the United States will face a similar set of circumstances and debates again. Will they pay close attention to this? You know what? Every generation learns the lesson it wants to learn uh, from its past history. And I do think that it's not the end of the conversation. Well, we'll be watching it when, they, when we face that uh, <laughs> consequence uh, and just hope that uh, people do learn from history and then learn the right lessons. Uh, one of which is when you overestimate your power, you usually over uh, extend yourself in ways that are going to be deeply damaging to interests and everything else. Uh, that's one lesson. Uh, and the other lesson, as Susan just put it, may well be that we don't learn them. Um, but with that uh, fascinating conversation, really want to thank all three of you, uh, Gideon Rockman, Susan Glasser and Carla Robbins. Uh, excellent conversation. We'll be back next week with a look at uh, the week's news. Until then, uh, thank you for listening. Uh, tune back in again next week. Until then, have a great weekend.